This is Kennedy Classics with Dr. D. James Kennedy. Welcome to Kennedy Classics. Welcome to Kennedy Classics. I'm Jerry Newcomb. And I'm Jennifer Cassidy. Everywhere you look, people are struggling as America suffers through the worst economic downturn in decades. What should we do about it? How can we best help people who are being hit hard by the recession? Many people think that the government needs to spend more money to help people. On today's program, we'll investigate whether that's a good solution and we'll point you to some valuable resources to help us reclaim the biblical view of the world upon which this nation was founded and built. And I'm John Sorensen. There have been a lot of lies promoted in world history, but I'll be back later to share with you a vital resource to help you grow in truth. But first, many think that the solution to our economic woes is for the government to spread the wealth around, to take more from the so-called 1% and give it to the so-called 99%. Are they right? My father, the late Dr. D. James Kennedy, addresses that question from a biblical perspective in his important message, The Bankruptcy of Socialism. And now may we hear the Word of God as it is found in the book of Acts, chapter four, beginning with verse 34. May we hear the inspired word of God. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of land or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And may God speak to us this day through this portion of his word, and may his name ever be praised. Amen. Though we have seen the greatest experiment in socialism in the history of the world in the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics come to a disastrous end, crash in flames and burn, and bring utter disaster and bankruptcy to that nation, and perhaps famine, still socialism is alive, though not well, in America. Well, we use other names for it. We call it the welfare state, a benevolent government, but it's the same thing regardless of what you call it. Russ Walton put it, put it very well when he said, government is not a producer, it is a taker, a taxer, and a spender. Every dollar spent by the public sector is a dollar the government must take from the private sector, from the workers and earners and investors. The dollar taken by the government cannot be spent or invested by that productive private section. But you know, these things are so benevolent sounding and they, they sound so Christian that we're trying to help people. And it's always that good intentions on the part of some politicians or bureaucrats that leads us into this disaster. But the thing that we need to understand is that the federal government is extraordinarily wasteful and extraordinarily inefficient and also that it creates far more problems than it helps. Professor Thomas Sowell, of Stanford University, one of America's leading black economists, said this, that the amount of money necessary to lift every man, woman, and child in America above the poverty line is one-third of what we are currently spending. But because of the incredible wastefulness of the federal government, what we do, he says, is simply find that the money ends up in the pockets of highly paid administrators, consultants, and staff. The reason that we're in a recession 
is because we don't have the capital to provide the jobs that people can work and earn money and spend it. Well, but people say, but yes, but nevertheless, that's what the Bible says we ought to be doing. We should be concerned about helping other people, absolutely. But we're not doing it in the way that we're trying to do it. We're hurting the people, putting people out of work, destroying their families, destroying children, all sorts of ghastly things. What is socialism? It is either that the government owns the means of production or controls the means of production and distribution. Well, does the Bible teach that? All sorts of liberal clergymen say that it does. And keep in mind that a liberal today politically, and that term changes over the years, but today what it means for the most part, with some exceptions, is a secular humanist socialist. That's this mindset that is the liberal mind and politics today. It's the same mindset that destroyed the communist world that is at work in America. And for the liberal clerics, it's the same mindset with a thin veneer of Christianity speared over it. And they've been saying for years, we must abandon our free enterprise system and we must adopt socialism because the Bible says so. Now, ordinarily, they don't care a thing about what the Bible says about much of anything else, but they get very biblical at this point. But what does the Bible say? Take the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not steal. For 200 years, theologians have been, for 2,000 years, rather, theologians have been saying that that is a guarantee by God of private property. God knows that we need that property in order that we might exercise our stewardship, that we might be good stewards of God. As John Wesley said, make as much as you can, save as much as you can, give as much as you can. And if we would do all three of those, we would find that our society would flourish indeed. The Tenth Commandment, thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not covet anything that is your neighbor's. It's his. It is your neighbor's. It belongs to him. You're neither to steal it nor even to covet it. And again, a guarantee of private property. But then they go to the passage that we read today. And they say, you see here, shows that in the early church, what they practiced was socialism. Well, is that true? It might seem to some that it, that it is. And certainly it has been trumpeted that it was. But I believe that a close look at that passage will reveal that not only is it not socialism, but it is antithetical to socialism completely. You notice that they brought the money and they laid it at the feet of, of Caesar, Pontius Pilate. No, they laid it at the feet of the apostles. The apostles! How appalling would Mark say. Give the money to the church? Why, it's unthinkable. It is the state that must have the power because the state is God and the state will be the provident provider for the needs of people so they will worship the state. But they gave the money to the church. Every socialist in the world would roll over in his grave at the sound of those words. No, my friends, this is a tremendous broadside against the ship of state of socialism. And all of their basic premises are demolished right here in what they consider the biblical citadel that supposedly teaches socialism. The truth is, it teaches the very opposite of it. And therefore, it is not biblical doctrine that we should be practicing socialism. Charles Hodge, the great Princeton theologian, said, the conditions of the success of this plan on any large scale cannot be found on earth. It supposes that men will labor as assiduously without the stimulus of the desire to improve their condition or to secure the welfare of their families as they will with it. It supposes absolute disinterestedness on the part of the more wealthy, the stronger, the more able members of the community. They must be willing to forego all personal advantages from their superior endowments. It supposes perfect integrity on the part of the distributors of the common fund and a spirit of moderation and contentment in each member of the community to be satisfied with what others and not they themselves may think to be their equitable shares. The attempt to introduce a general community of goods in the present state of the world instead of elevating the poor 
would reduce the whole mass of society to a common level of barbarism and poverty. And Charles Hodge said that at Princeton over a hundred years ago because his eyesight was strengthened by the teachings of the Word of God. And as we have gotten away from that Word, we have found ourselves more and more wandering in the desert. We need to realize, my friends, what lessons God would be teaching us. We need to stand up and say, we have had enough of this. Look what atheism has produced in other parts of the world. We don't want it here. We want the religious freedom that our founders gave to us. We don't want this socialistic mess of pottage that you're trying to force on us. We want the free enterprise system that the founders of this country gave to us, which made America the strongest and the most bountiful and plentiful nation that the world had ever seen, and which is now making other nations who have copied it the same or even more so as we turn our backs upon it. As Edmund Opitz said, poverty in a society is overcome by productivity and in no other way. There is no political alchemy which can transmute diminished production into increased consumption. And the more money that is taken out of the private sector, the more poverty there is going to be. It's only the private sector that can produce productive jobs and increase productivity. But you know, we can't blame it on the politicians, at least certainly not all of it. We often hear that the politicians are just buying our votes by taxing and giving us more things, giving us more things that they take the money from from ourselves. That's true. But why are they doing that? Because when they try to be responsible and when they try to restrain government spending, we vote them right out of office. The problem is with our own hearts, our own greed, our own desire for something for nothing, for more and more and more for the, from the government trough. That's the problem, and that's why the politicians act that way. I'll tell you this. If your eyes were open and you saw the colossal wastefulness, you saw the mounting federal debt which is going to be disastrous, you saw the inefficiency and ineffectiveness of these government programs, and you know that they don't work and they create more problems than they solve, when a politician tells you that he's going to tax more and spend more, he wouldn't get your vote. But when he told you that he was going to cut taxes and cut spending, he would have your vote and he would stay in. The federal government doesn't have anything to begin with. It all comes out of our pockets. May God, through the truth of his word, open our eyes and change our hearts that we might trust in the living God and follow his principles. And my friends, unless we trust in Christ as our Savior, unless we know that his Father has promised to provide all of our needs out of his riches and glory, we're going to continue to look to a provident state and we're going to move more and more into despotism and socialistic tyranny and economic ruin in this country. May we take the lessons of this past year and build on them and say, no more. We want true religious liberty and we want true financial liberty as well. And we want the government off our back. And God will bless this nation as he's never done before. May we pray. Father, let us have eyes to see the lessons that are writ large for us on the wall of life. And let us learn from the things of this past year and not wander as blind, dumb sheep, not knowing where we're going and why things are happening to us. But let us see the principles of your word. And most of all, let us see the love of Christ, who alone can deliver us from want and fear and grant us the confidence and joy that he alone can give. In his name, amen. Have you come to trust in Christ as your Savior, as Dr. Kennedy spoke of? If not, I would urge you right now to place your trust in him. You see, no government can do for us what Christ has already done. Only Jesus Christ offers the free gift of eternal life paid for with His death on the cross.
He purchased a place for us in heaven, which He offers to us, to you even now, as a free gift. If you'd like to receive this gift, we can go to God in prayer right now saying, Lord Jesus Christ, I know that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. Please forgive my sins and cleanse me and make me brand new. Thank you for granting me eternal life, life forever with you in heaven. In your name I pray, amen. I hope you prayed that prayer and meant it. And if you did, then you've begun a journey that will take you all the way to paradise. To help you in that journey, we would love to send you Beginning Again, a book written by Dr. Kennedy. In it, you'll learn how to stay right with God, how to read and study the Bible, which is something every believer needs to do, and you'll learn how to pray. There's much more in here, so contact us today and ask for Beginning Again. Just write to our address or call our toll-free number or log on to truthinaction.org. God bless you. As my father emphasized in the message you just heard, socialism is not the answer. From a biblical perspective, it encourages envy and covetousness, and it actually stifles economic growth and innovation. Yet even in America today, some form of socialism or another is persistently offered as the cure to all our ills. And unfortunately, even many Christians vote for it. As the old saying goes, if you're going to rob Peter to pay Paul, you can always count on Paul's vote. But in reality, redistributing wealth and cutting the link between work and income proves harmful to the health of a nation and its people. And yet, our rulers in Washington continue to nudge us towards socialism as the government takes over health care, buys major chunks of failing corporations, and penalizes employers through regulation and taxation in the name of fairness. To understand the danger, we need to look at the roots. Today, we investigate the rise of socialism in the 20th century and what the long shadow of Karl Marx has really left behind. Karl Marx was an immensely influential thinker. The main idea of socialism is that you do away with private property. Private property was the essence of evil. If you think you've misunderstood me, that I want your private property, you haven't misunderstood. That's exactly what I want. I want the abolition of private property. Karl Marx. David Horowitz, writer and policy advocate, grew up in an American communist household. What Marxism was and, and, and is, and what communism is, is a crypto religion. Redemption doesn't come about through a divine savior. It comes about through human agents, through the state. At the root of that, this idea that you can make a perfect society here in this world, that you can make a heaven on earth, and that's just a false idea. Joshua Moravchik, author of Heaven on Earth, The Rise and Fall of Socialism. The flaw in the idea uh, at the beginning is uh, to uh, suppose that human nature is only material and to completely downplay both the spiritual and the intellectual side of human beings. The scripture is uh, very clear on the nature of man. David Noble, the founder and director of Summit Ministries, has written extensively on competing worldviews. The whole Marxist-Leninist worldview and the Christian worldview are at odds on nearly every point because one is theistic and one is atheistic. Marx grew up in a household in which religion really was kind of hypocritical because they were practicing religion that they were forced to practice, not that they embraced in their heart. Karl Marx was, in fact, uh, a hardcore atheist through his university education and coming into contact with the left wing of that time, which was basically anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-religion. Engels, his partner, came from a very different background. He came, grew up in a very religious town, and since their deepest commitment was their religious faith, he made that the number one issue of his uh, rebellion. They came to socialism not primarily through their analysis of 
politics and economics, but as very young men in their uh, angry analysis of religion. We want to sweep away everything that claims to be supernatural and superhuman. For that reason, we have once and for all declared war on religion and religious ideas. Frederick Engels. Marx argued that all religion was superstition, that it was just hocus pocus, mumbo jumbo. If you don't believe in a God who redeems in an afterlife, then you will believe in, in gods in this life. And that is the most dangerous belief of all. The Communist Manifesto was written by Marx and Engels in 1848 as the platform for the Communist Revolution. So there should be no misrepresentation of what Marx, Marxist socialism is because he has identified it for us in writing. The Communist Manifesto is an evil document. It opens with the sentence, the history of all hitherto existing societies is the history of class struggle. It's an incitement to war, civil war. The manifesto laid out a blueprint or plan of action that would usher in their classless society. The plan included such things as abolition of private property, a heavy progressive or graduated income tax, centralization of credit by means of a national bank, state-controlled media, factories owned by the state. In the Communist Manifesto, Karl Marx decided how to destroy two things, destroy God and destroy capitalism. The late Chuck Colson, cultural commentator and author. Uh, when you depart from the Bible and you think that your guidelines are to fulfill God's will, and you come up with your own humanistic understanding, whether you call it Marxism or Freudianism or uh, any of the isms, uh, which all lie on the ash heap of history at the moment, what you're doing is leading people into tyranny. In 1917, Vladimir Lenin rose to power and led the Russian Revolution. Lenin affirmed the philosophical basis of Marxism is a materialism which is absolutely atheistic and positively hostile to all religion. When Marx was put into practice in the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, the first ones to feel it were the Christians and the Christian churches. And they destroyed 100,000 Russian churches. They were burned. They were turned into museums of atheism. This was only the beginning of the atrocities of their revolutionary government. People are always worried about Christianity being a, a pernicious influence in society. Look at what atheistic, humanistic systems have done over the last two centuries. This is all based on a socialist experiment, which people need to understand. In fact, the death toll of the whole 20th century is basically a socialistic experiment. Nazism was socialistic, fascism was socialistic, communism was socialistic, and those three alone with the, the death toll just went into uh, tens of millions. Socialism has kind of proved itself to be bankrupt, but but it's not dying out in the intellectual world. Basically where we are today in our country is that we have uh, decided for some reason that even in spite of all of the socialistic failures of the 20th century, we're still toying with a socialistic idea that we're somehow going to find a political utopia and paradise uh, via socialism. Every time the state increases its power, we lose our freedom. We are watching the encroaching forces of secularism. We are watching you systematically strip away our liberties one by one. We are watching you try to prevent the religious influence in public life. It should be of great concern to everyone who is interested in where we're going as a country. Our way of changing the system is you vote. Their way of changing the system is violence and any means necessary. I think that we're in a period where we have a great chance to take back a lot of territory, but I, I think that uh, it's, it's going to be a, a very big battle. The collapse of the Berlin Wall should have been the end of socialism. But unbelievably, many in our own government have enacted a federal takeover of health care and have big plans for an all-controlling, all-consuming federal government. But this deadly course can and must be reversed. The destruction that socialism brings can be avoided in America, but we must wake up 
and stand up now. 2014 is an election year, and we need leaders who understand the true biblical and constitutional role of government. In contrast to socialism and communism, which are ultimately based on an anti-God philosophy, the founders of America, even those who weren't personally born again, saw that the purpose of government is to protect our God-given rights. But so few people today seem to be aware of our nation's roots. One of D. James Kennedy's great passions was to help us understand America's true heritage. He helped reawaken Christians to the biblical worldview held by America's founding fathers. That's more needed today than ever, which is why we've produced a hard-hitting new DVD bundle called The Bible and the Presidents. This four DVD set contains some of Dr. Kennedy's most important messages on several of the leaders who made this nation great, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Abraham Lincoln. There's been so much misinformation and revisionist history spread about these men. Hear the truth from Dr. D. James Kennedy. We'll send you the DVD set, The Bible and the Presidents, when you give a generous gift to the ongoing work of this ministry. Simply write to us at Box 6053, Albert Lee, Minnesota, 56007, or call toll-free 877-942-7677, or go online to truthinaction.org. We need to study these great leaders and the Christian principles they believed that were essential to the survival and prospering of America if we're ever going to have leaders like them again. If you contact us right away to give a generous gift and receive the DVD set as our gift, we'll also include the booklet, What They Believed, which contains these important messages in written form. Some of you can give a gift of $30, others can give $500 or $1,000 or more. Whatever the amount, please know that your gift will help us continue fighting the battle for truth during this important election year. Again, simply write to us at Box 6053, Albert Lee, Minnesota, 56007, or call toll-free 877-942-7677, or go online to truthinaction.org. With your help, we will continue to share biblical truth on these issues that are so vital at this point in American history. Please consider giving a generous gift today so that the heritage left to us by men like George Washington will still be there for your children and grandchildren. May God bless you as you do. And may God bless America. Next week on Kennedy Classics. How desperately we need heroes. The government, because it has the legal monopoly of force, is far more dangerous than any private individual, any family, any church, any business. That's next week. A video of today's program is available on DVD for your gift to this ministry of any amount. So please, call, write, or log on to our website today. This has been a production of Truth in Action Ministries.